You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show with your host, Brian Callen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, The Brian Callen Hunter Mott's experience is back. Uh, m- m- our producer, Mike Casentini, was like, you got to choose whether it's The Brian Callen Show. What are you doing? <laughs> it's The Brian Callen Show. Yeah, stick to it, Brian. We got to talk into the mic. Yeah, I'll never sorry, hear you. That's why it's The Brian Callen Show because I, I can't even get talking into the this. mic right. So. Well, I'm very excited because we have the great Katie O'Brien um, in house, uh, me and Hunter and Katie and myself are working on a TV show that's going to change. It's really going to revolutionize entertainment. I think I th- it's really going to revolutionize America. Get if closer. If we're going for it. You, you think know? really it's going to me- revolutionize Just America? America? Ka- for starters. For starters. <laughs> Katie, if you were president, well, let's let me let me put it this when way. When you're president. When you're president. Correct. If I were to give you um, ultimate power. And you could change, and, I, and you got it for three days, and you can change anything you want. What would it be? First, I would give Brian Callen a Netflix special. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Thank you. God damn it. Netflix, do you hear that? <laughs> that would be number one. And if it takes a whole day, I'll give a whole day to that. That's fine. Thank you. I appreciate that. What uh, else would you do? What would I do next? I would maybe... I mean, if we're going serious, I would probably eliminate every news network and just start fresh with one that was unbiased reporting of actual facts so well, that Americans well, would you do that? could know what was going on again. How would you do that? By, by, by not making news as profitable? Yeah, I would like maybe take away the 24-hour news cycle, mm. go back to the Cronkite kind of good times where the news was just where you came once a day to get the actual facts of what went on. Without any sensational... The problem with doing that is you'd have to actually stop people from coming up with all kinds of ideas, probably including The Daily Show and The Colbert Show. So you're kind of not a very good leader. Mm, no, I think that satire doesn't fall under but now networks you're, that now you're deciding as news channels. Now you're deciding what satire is, though. Yeah, because you told me I have ultimate power for three days. <laughs> oh, shit, sorry. What's wrong with this game? <laughs> sorry, man, I know. Listen to me. Brian, do you want that Netflix special? What's that? Yes, How I do. How badly do you want that I Netflix want it, special? I want it, I want yeah, it. Exactly. Back to you, Madam Emperor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. I like what you're saying, I though. I start from a place where people are working from facts, again, as opposed to non-dialogue, where people just spout Attitude, things they've attitude. heard at each other that they haven't fact checked or that's my problem no that's that my, really bothers me yeah that's my problem with fox news and and, and CNN problem with, and, with on both sides fox news and msnbc i mean they both sort yeah. of have a lot of hours to fill and i think it leads to some dangerous things where do you get your news from uh npr and like bbc that's because, me too yeah yeah yeah, Hunter asked, what about Al Jazeera? <laughs> Al Jazeera. Or Russia Today. Yes. Nothing says truth. <laughs> like, like Pravda. Russia today. Like Pravda. Um, uh, so, so what else would you change? What else would I change? Well, I, obviously, I would change the educational system. We, know, we know that already. Um, I would set us up so that from the earliest age, kids knew what it actually takes to learn something and understood why things go wrong, why they make mistakes and how to fix them and sort of took all the emotion out of school, all the stress, all the feeling like you're not good enough or like you're better at some things than others naturally and just like help people understand their brains, you know, so that they can become as well-rounded and amazing in so many areas as Brian Callen. Well, they just that's... they just saw me pulverize a bag, <laughs> uh, and by bag I mean heavy bag. Uh, you guys wrote a book called *The Straight A Conspiracy*, and uh, it's dedicated to this subject. While we're on it, Hunter Mats, you have the mic. What would you um, What would you do if I made you emperor? Well, I'm still trying to imagine a world of Brian Callens, and it's just, you know, I feel like I've seen the promised land. Damn right. Yeah. <laughs> Where every child is a small Brian Callen. <laughs> Where every child's a clone. Have you been to Brian Callen Street? It's on the. It's right next to Brian Callen Street. Uh, I believe that every child would... has infinite potential. The potential to be me. <laughs> there it is. 
There it is. I hold myself to a high standard. What would you do? Uh, well, I think you've asked me this question before. Yeah, I like it though. You're very good. Yeah. At, you're very good at taking all the things we have been exposed to and putting them in neat little shells for me to kind of digest. Well, but I I think that that gets to Katie's point. That's the power of learning how to learn, which is that you understand that it's all about how you arrange the, you know, I mean, my apartment is a disaster, but my mind is well organized. Um, And that's, I mean, that's really what it's about. It's about figuring out, okay, what are the large ideas that organize them? How do these things interrelate? How do you connect them all into a big web? And, you know, one of the things that we use in the book is it's, you know, people tend to think that, you know, uh, essentially your memory is a giant waste paper basket and you just shove as much crap in there as you can or they think of it like a computer hard drive that has a fixed amount of space. But really it's like things keep on trying to float away and you have to tie them down. And the more things you tie together, the more likely they are to stay in, in place. So if you take a single fact or a single idea and you connect it into five or six other things then it becomes really memorable. And one of the surprising things about that is, is that it's actually easier to remember more information than less information. It but, is? Yeah. Why? Because, because you have context. That's what more information does. So if you, if that's, it, it's the difference between you watching a fight and me watching a fight. I have no context, no real understanding of fighting except for the amazing boxing lesson you gave me 30 minutes ago. Thank you. Um, and so... Yeah, and now my hand hurts. But the 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 result is that if I watch a boxing match or if I'm watching something like that, it's all a blur to me. Like there's no way for me to make make sense of it. I'm not really going to remember what's happened. You know, I might remember you know a few little details. For you, because you have such a context on how fighting works, it all fits very easily into w- what you know. Mm. And so you're able to be like, oh, he did this, this, this. He's doing this combo. He's doing this. That's a trade thing of him look at his footwork it all fits within a narrative it all fits within an understanding for you and so it's all much much more memorable because i'm more fluent in that language exactly yeah. and, it, and it also you know you can sort of read it in chunks of moves as opposed to hunter would just be like he did this i think that's a jab now here's a different move you see it as oh this is one two three and then the big well one. that's how josh waitskin who said the reason he can beat you in chess so quickly and 50 people at the same time is he's able to chunk information mm-hmm. he's seen the board way more than you have when you roll jujitsu with a really good guy he's been there what are you trying to do yeah. an arm lock he's bit he sees you doing that a mile away. He's gonna. He's already countered you before you thought of it. The minute you started moving in that direction, not only did he counter it, but it's the same thing. Do you think that everything is a language, including ethics and morality, uh, virtue? Well, I mean, one of the things we do actually know now is is that you can teach empathy. Empathy can be grown, and one of the primary ways of growing empathy is to read fiction. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. That's why I'm so empathetic. Right? <laughs> you read a lot of fiction? English majors are the most empathetic yeah. people. Five, five, five seminal books for you. Oh, that's really... I hate when people ask me this question. That's terrible because you can't so choose... so many different books. I can't decide. Okay, how about, how about five writers that you are in awe of that kind of floor you? Brian Cowan. Yeah, right. Hunter Motz. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Shakespeare is an obvious answer, but I actually became obsessed with Shakespeare in college. But that's actually a really good, you know, that goes right to Hunter's point because like a lot of high schoolers, I think for a long time, that was just like, I don't understand what half of these words mean. This is just a million lines of verse in a row. What the heck? And then the more that you read, the more you see the patterns and the more you understand the themes that come back and back. And you're like, oh, this character is kind of like this character. And, you know, that's really what that memory and that appreciation comes from is is attacking everything by finding out why it's relevant to you. And that's what makes things memorable is like being in the ready position and like diving in and figuring out why do I care about this rather than just kind of expecting it to go into your brain and stay there for you. Well, knowing, knowing then why you care about something. So knowing mm-hmm. context, cause I noticed I, I, my, my kids go to Montessori and I, I sat in on the teacher parent conference. She was explaining how they use beads to show what the square root of something is. Mm-hmm. I never even thought of that. Didn't even know it. I wish somebody had showed me visually a concept of what the square root of something is or what cubed is. And I went, Oh my God, that, well, there it is. You can kind of see these things, but it, 
Because because imagine going through school and when you first encounter anything, also being shown why it matters. That's huge. What a huge difference. With but that people is. don't ask themselves that question. Like I notice a lot of times, uh, you know, being in Bora Bora, <laughs> which is it, 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 if you don't go there unless you've got money. My dad foot the bill, but. There I am in this, it's one of the most beautiful places. I've been in a lot of places in my life, and I've been alive for a long time. And that that place is, I, I mean, top three most beautiful places. Yet after eight, nine days, and I'm not being spoiled when I say this, there wasn't a whole, you know, you can snorkel and you can scuba dive and you can be on jet skis. It doesn't compare to learning something for me. It doesn't. And as beautiful as those fish were when I was feeding them, and I had these visual experiences, and my my view and my geography was different, and it it doesn't compare with learning something, with being what I consider productive and growing and expanding my passion and my understanding in general. And that was fat. I mean, I've always known that, but that's a stark example when you're there and people spend so much, and so many people love that stuff. And they'll sit there and drink and zone out. And I don't know if that's being fair to most people at Bora Bora, but, you know, but anyway, it, it was... Well, but it's the difference between pleasures and gratifications, um, which, you know, I think I've talked about this before, but Mihai Chixit Mihai, who's the guy who works on Flow, he did this famous experiment where he took a group of high schoolers who were, you know, high flow. Essentially, these were jocks and nerds, people who were really engaged and always challenging themselves. And then people who are low flow, in other words, kids who are mall rats, who spend their time playing video games and eating crap food and doing all of that stuff. And he gave them pagers. And he would randomly page them throughout the day and ask them to report their level of happiness. And by every measure, the kids who were highly engaged, really challenging themselves all the time, were much, much, much happier, except for one measure. They thought the kids who were playing video games were having more fun. And that is... They thought the they kids. They thought the kids. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the thing, is just that, you know, being challenged, that is the most satisfying experience. But the kids who were playing video games were not having more fun. Actually happier. They're not, they were not happier. No. I would also add to that from my experience that when you're always actively engaged in challenging yourself, you form very deep and strong bonds with other people that are doing mm-hmm. the same thing. Uh, you know, if you're, if you watch fighters who are in like UFC and they, they are in the same camp and they corner each other and they're in the back room before that fight, those bonds die hard. Those mm-hmm. are strong bonds. You know, it's 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 a Spartan bond that that is it's soldiers that go to battle together. Those guys are the same way. You know, you you meet some Marines who've gone through the thick of things. That that they, they are brothers. They're 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 brothers. The band of brothers. Yeah, and that really is that. And that's part of off. I mean, you know, uh, Jonathan Haidt talks about this a lot. And you know, it's often very hard for people to come back. And part of that is raw PTSD. But part of it is that also the experience of combat is so emotionally heightened. You know, there are those really strong bonds. I mean, it's such an intense experience that, you know, then coming back to ordinary life is sort of disappointing in some ways. Yeah. It doesn't have that same emotional engagement. Um, but, you know, so, you, yeah. so, I mean, that's the thing, Brian, is this, although you've never been in, you know, war, mm. you know, the, the war of art, so to speak, I mean, that experience of being in flow and being engaged and being challenged, I mean, the experience of flow, you know, then the experience of transcendence, you know, they often talk about it. It's like touching the face of God. Well, you know? well, and Schiller, who said, man is never more himself than when at play. Mm-hmm. Play is something you do for its own sake, not for status, and not for money, not for power. It's something you do to be free. It's something you do when you are free. And I, 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 my life has been geared, certainly, to experience as much of that as I can, which is probably why I don't drink and do blow and do all those things. Mm-hmm. I, there's nothing that compares to me than communicating with an audience. The challenge for a guy like me is that it makes it very hard on my family and people close to me because, you know, I trying to be a good father and a present father when your kid is three and six and they want to play pokey plants where he wants to poke chopsticks into a fucking leaf. And my daughter's burying a sea cucumber and asking me what kind of shells she should put on and then making me watch for an hour. That's as much as I love the shit out of my kids. 
that's not that fun. I get really bored quickly and I'm worrying now because I'm wasting time and I'm not working on what I should be working on. Well, the thing that I was going to say before I hand it over to the very talented Katie O'Brien is that that's also part of it. I mean, look at how you're engaging with that experience. You're not engaging with it. Like you're sitting there, you, you, exp- you part of it is, is that you, you know, you said Schiller play, right? You're not engaged in that play. Rather than, I mean, I think part of how you change that experience for yourself is to actually engage in the play with your son and your daughter. Yeah. Also because, yeah, also because you're in a very amazing position compared to many people in the universe that that play could lead to your work. I mean, even you describing the sea cucumber funeral earlier, I was already laughing and that couldn't be, you know, everything for you. Oh, believe me, I was writing. Oh, no, no, no. Don't kid yourself. I was writing about it. But the difference is that, like, look at your face right now talking about writing it into a routine versus how you were thinking of it at the time. And that's what everything is. I was thinking of it as a waste of time. Exactly. But it wasn't. If you thought about it then in that moment as like, well, if I just go with this for another 20 minutes, something ridiculous is going to come out of it, like, which is true, you know, but that's, I need to do that. So many people, I mean, think about how many people in the world go into their work day, not looking for that opportunity to be engaged, to find out why is this exciting? What can I make out of this? Even if it's terrible, even if this is not what I want to be doing. Listen, you know, I I never thought I'd say this. And since the podcast and people listen, it's, it's, I may as well, but I don't think I, I look and experience my children the way I should. I don't even think I do that with my wife enough, you know, and that's a learning process for someone like me, you know, and when I hear you say that, that makes sense because they are worth it. They're, they're, also they're hilarious. worth it. Yeah, and they're awesome. My wife is fucking hilarious. They're all hilarious, yeah. you know, and I need to, uh, you're right. I mean, I, I, I'm not taking advantage of the gold that's already Exactly. You know, in my life. And I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you know, uh, firstly, I mean, Louis C.K., like every comedian, so much of it just comes from their family. Yeah. Right. And so that's the thing is, you know, for, for, for your son and your daughter, they don't really care why you're playing Pokey Plant or helping with the burial of the sea cucumber. Right. They experience it as, oh, my dad is engaged. 30 years from now, when they, you know, go through the archive of the collected wisdom of Brian Callen and they listen to this podcast, they may find out, oh, actually, he was using me. <laughs> but 100%. Yeah. 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 That's my son. Do you want to let him in? Keep recording, Brian. All right, this let's is, let this my is son an opportunity in. for you to put this in practice. My son wants his arrow back. You want your arrow back? Yeah. Well, what 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 kind of arrow is it? I still and I don't want that. Oh, you don't want the microphone? No. All right, that's okay. I'm just talking into it. So, what do you want to do? You want to play here in in the room? No, I want my bow and arrow. You want your, he wants his bow and arrow and now he's he's he is out your of son, it. son Brian Callen. <laughs> He's Meanwhile, his pose right now is very similar to very this. similar to mine. My son is just like me. You're cute. I'm not. I think I'm you're cute, and I love I'm you. Not. Well, okay. Um, see, this is how you relate to a three-year-old. I'm glad we're recording this. What, what, what do you want? What do you want to do besides bow and arrow? I want dolphin. He's punching the mic out of my hand. Oh. All right. Why don't you hit the bag? Hit the heavy bag. Okay, do you want to just sit there and be generally annoyed? Sometimes yeah. that feels good. All right, let me take him to his mommy. Hold on. That was Parenting 101 with Brian Callen. <laughs> Live and uncensored. We're still recording, by the way. Oh, we are? Yeah. Oh, this is fun. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway. This is a lot of power. So Each what, of us has a microphone now. Brian Callen has well, no microphone. Well, what would you do on your third day as Empress? <laughs> mm. Hmm. Hmm. 
Well, I already fixed the things that bother me the most. That Brian Callen doesn't have a Netflix special and... And the media yeah, and, and education. education. Let's see, where would I go Can I next? ask a more fundamental question? Yes. <laughs> if you fix those two things, doesn't everything else I ultimately so. fall into place? That's why I don't have any other answers, because I think that... So maybe your I third day you pull a George Washington. On the third day, I rest. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and look at what you've wrought. <gasps> yes, because in this version of reality, the next day after I fix the media and education, everyone is a new person. <laughs> well, the, just, the, the next effect day takes hold that quickly. Well, the next day, what happens is, is that the your successor comes in and undoes everything that I you've know, done, that's including true. Brian Callen's Netflix special. Face. Yeah, exactly. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you think they undo the Netflix special first or? I feel like they deserve to stay up for at least three days. Yeah, probably. Probably. <sighs> Tragic. Or that may be the one thing that survives from your presidency. Maybe probably on the third day before they take my power away, I should add myself to Rushmore. And then that will be harder to undo <laughs> than, <laughs> than, yeah. than all the other good work that i That's true. That's true. See, <laughs> my brain instantly went to Rushmore the movie rather than Mount Rushmore. <laughs> and I was like, how's that going to work? <laughs> um, yeah. 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 What about you? Uh, that's the thing. I think I'd probably make a single speech to get uh, the ideas out there that I think I that I think matter. Um, you know, campaign finance, education, all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. And then I would retire. And I then I'd be like, I want no part of this. I would. I would not enact a single law because I was like, you didn't elect me. Right. I was made emperor by Brian Callen. That's wise. Yeah, and so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to make any laws. That's very noble. Yeah, thanks. I don't know that I could take that high. Yeah, of a high road. it's it's the George Washington approach. <laughs> um, <laughs> Brian Callen just wandered in and then back out. This will officially be the weirdest episode yeah, of right. the Brian Callen show. <laughs> in all, well, you know, there. Your son walks in. You help him. He wants a we'll bow probably, and arrow, and then you walk out. We'll and probably then, edit all that out, or we won't. <laughs> Or we won't. Um, or you can just remix that middle section, kind of chop it up, auto tune it. Yeah. Well, my son always has a, a weapon in his hand, uh, and they say that men, the boys, romanticize killing; girls romanticize love. They write love letters to Justin Bieber. Boys are stabbing a cardboard box. That could be That's true. That's a typical male-female difference. My uh, my cousin when he was really really little my he's the youngest of all of us and my aunt and uncle made an enormous effort to not give him any really gendered toys mm. when he was young and uh in that family there yeah there were, i grew up in new england and so they are sailors both of them and so one day yeah having given him nothing not a gun not a gi joe not a anything ever they walked into the room and he had turned, he had sort of like fashioned what was obviously a gun out of Legos. Yeah. And he's like playing by himself. Pew, 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 pew. Yeah. And they walk in there like, Ben, what is that? And he turns and sees them and he like flips it over and he goes, it's a boat. Because he, like, not only had figured out how to play with guns, but also had figured out how to work it so that, like... He Anybody who thinks that that's not a male thing is out of their minds. I mean, in every every culture in the world, the men are the ones that shoot the bow and arrows, throw the spears, stab you, and, and shoot you. Uh, we have dicks. Uh, and, 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 and I don't like using the word dick because it sounds small and broken. But but uh, thank you, Joe Rogan. That's his, his joke. But... Um, but you know, you you, you the, the pen the pro the act of penetration is a male thing, man. I mean, there's uh, th I can't remember what it is, but there's this legendary book. Um, this woman was a kindergarten teacher or whatever it was, and it you know this was in the sixties or the seventies, and she was so upset by how, just how gendered the play was, and so she tried to move the girls over to the blocks corner and move the boys over to the dollhouse. And the the boys turned the dollhouse into a spaceship, <laughs> and the girls turned the blocks into a dollhouse ah, or whatever it really? was. And she was like, yeah, you can't fight it. No, that's some yeah. things are hardwired, man. Yeah. Thank God. Well. Thank God. I love the difference. Vive la différence. 
Brian, um, did you study French? Je parle français. Uh, I spoke French in Tahiti uh, poorly, but it was awesome. <laughs> je prends un espresso, s'il vous plaît, avec uh, du lait à côté, à part. <laughs> ah, tu parles français, hein? c'est gentil. Ah, merci beaucoup. But appris. the crucial thing is, who did you speak French in front of? Oh, just the Tahitian uh, waitresses and waiters yeah. and, uh, and, and the French. Did you think about going Gauguin? He died of leprosy, I believe, in Tahiti. No, so syphilis, actually. Was it syphilis? <laughs> syphilis yeah, yeah, he had his fun with the Tahitian. It's funny, I don't know how. No, actually, he, it's the other way around. They believe that he was responsible for introducing syphilis to the islands of Tahiti. I bet he was. Yeah. Gauguin was a guy who literally, I think at 40, he was a banker, up and just left his wife and children, a real peach. He <laughs> left them, I guess he left them in France and then moved to England and lived there on handouts and started painting. And uh, and then finally found himself in Tahiti. Yep. There's a good book about him, The Moon and Sixpence by Somerset Maugham. We never got to your favorite writers. Oh, sorry. We talked about Shakespeare and then yeah. we stopped there. Um, this is hard. I always hate this question. I would say Hemingway. Yes. I have read everything of his. I really Me like too. Him. Um. Uh I don't know. I get this is the problem is you 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 peak and then once you yeah. read too much then you like this is the same idea. It's like it's like listening to music. It's like uh, yeah, pens. John's great, like, but I went through my it phase about on John. My yeah. Mood and then also the more you read the more you're like, well, this clump is good for this reason and this clump of people is good for this reason and yeah, I don't know. I mean, but I go back and back again and again to But was there a book me. that you read um that caused you like for example when i saw ferris bueller's day off yeah i said i have to reassess my life and if i don't do what i really want to do whatever that is i was young i'm gonna just be my, my biggest fear is that i'm i'm the guy who didn't stop and smell the roses i'm the guy that didn't follow his bliss i'm the guy that didn't take the courageous choice and now i'm living this mundane quiet life of desperation as Thoreau said so you know those were the kinds of movies less less books more movies for me but yeah. since you read a lot was there a book that well, did I something did. to you I remember just being really blown away by all the by even all the like high school classics that everyone hates to read like Great Expectations just totally couldn't get through it blew my don't, mind don't Tale the... Two Cities hated every minute the Great Expectations, I just loved. I loved every minute of Gatsby. I just thought that was so amazing. Really? Gatsby, read it twice. But then I also just watched Three Amigos and Spaceballs like 200,000 times when I was young. So Yeah. <laughs> Went, you know, both directions. But um, what yeah. made you What made you decide to come Actually, to Los Angeles and be an actress? Because um, that's a crazy choice, isn't cause it? Because I was in... Well, I always, I always wanted to act and and was like writing and directing plays with my friends and whatever from a really young age and that's why I was an English major and whatever but and then I went to New York and then I just really loved being in New York but I was doing a lot of comedy stuff and I was like eh, I should go to LA before I fall so in love with New York that I never leave so <sighs> let me just you. go to LA for three months and just, but I'll be too east coast for it and da -da. and everyone in LA is from New York and Boston anyway I know and it's also really nice here. It's easy to I was live. like, ah, I'm in New York. I thrive on this pace. I'm up until 6 a.m. and then I go to the Westway Diner and eat food and then I sign for this audition and then I go back and and then I got it here. I was like, I'm tired. Yeah. This is much nicer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sunshine. Yeah, it's good. Um, here though, to answer your question from before, I just thought of this. Like, it actually wouldn't have been like with Shakespeare, it wasn't reading Shakespeare that got me so fired up about is the first time that I saw a really good production where I was just like, now I get why this is so amazing. Like I saw a production of Midsummer in the UK. Yeah, of, of Hunter Mott Hunter in Mott's Hamlet. as Hamlet. <laughs> I'm the Dane. <laughs> 
Um, no, I saw this production of That's Mr. such nerdy humor, by that the is, way. That is. <laughs> like, you guys are like, and then Hunter was the Dane. Everybody oh was like, God, what the I fuck are you talking joke. about, man? Yeah. Like, like, like you, you Harvard intellectuals <laughs> are always like, here, 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 just like, hey, can you imagine Hunter is the Dane? It's like, what the fuck are they talking about, it's, man? Have you ever seen With Nail and I? Yeah, great movie. Love that movie. One of the greatest movies. I don't care yeah. what anybody says. Richard E. Grant is brilliant in that movie. I've seen him on stage. That guy is a great actor. Yeah. Don't see him enough in movies anymore. No. I don't know what happened, but I How love How to Get that Ahead guy. in Advertising. Oh, my it's such God. Such a great movie. That's one of the great. Yeah. I saw that movie by accident. And I was like, holy shit. Yeah, it's so good. But oh. uh, but oh. do, you remember, do you remember his uncle? The, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. heavy, just d- living yeah, with exactly. all the cats. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> who, who, who <laughs> has Great one movie. of the greatest lines in all of cinema when he says, at a certain point in life, a young man realizes that he will never play the Dane. <laughs> I he never play Hamlet for any of you who don't know what I'm talking yeah. about. Never play the day. <laughs> but there's I love that there, shit. There's so many great lines, and yeah, that's like I mean, that's the quintessentially pretentious British shit to insist upon referring to Shakespeare as the Bard, the bard. and Hamlet as the day. God damn it! Those are the moments in your life when you like you see movies or you read books or. Where you're just like, th- not only is all right in the world, but this is incredible. Like, yeah. I'd rather be nowhere else. Yeah. I think I was writing to you guys about talking to that dude who sells a $25 cup of coffee in... Uh, in oh, yeah. And I'm telling you, when I say I didn't want to move my feet, I'm serious. Like I was like, he was this old hippie who who was in this mall that was falling apart, and he was the last vestige. The, the lease was running out; they were going to turn into condos, and he still had this this coffee shop that now he had to work in because it didn't work out for him, so he couldn't afford to hire employees. And he had a bonsai tree, and he had this incredible. <laughs> incredible espresso machine that was made by some one family in Italy that clearly cost way more money than any espresso ma- machine that's ever been made. It was a jewel. It was a piece of jewelry. And uh, and he was talking to me about how, why a $25 cup of coffee is worth, worth it when it comes from the bean of this cat that shits them out. Kopi Luwak. Yeah, a Kopi Luwak. Kopi Luwak. Not because it's a better cup necessarily, but it comes with a story. And I just... I literally was like, I'd rather be nowhere else because this one dude who seems to be, it's like this little man holding up the dam. Like the, the dam, he's, he's plugging the dam for, for no other reason than that there is beauty in the world and he has to be its keeper yes. in this particular time, in this particular space. And that he sells coffee that is being eaten by a civet cat and then shat out. And then an Indonesian person has come along, collected the cat droppings, washed off the poo, and sold it for a lot of money. You're really not romanticizing this in the correct way. <laughs> That's because I've tasted Kopi Luwak, and I know what that coffee tastes like. And it does taste like a cat's ass. Like a huge <laughs> turd. Yeah. Nice. I believe it. I, I, I believe it. There's this you know, there's no reason why it's any better than anything else. Yeah. It's worse. It's the answer. It's worse. <laughs> it's worse. It's not good. Kopi Luwak. Yeah. Well, I contend that there's a lot of coffee. You can spend a lot of money on coffee. And the truth is that you're spending money on the fact that it wasn't roasted as long. And that means it's just got a higher caffeine kick. And so, you know, that's what you're addicted to. Really probably not the taste. I've had coffee that was very expensive that tasted like cardboard. Mm-hmm. So there's a reason we roast coffee. And, you know, I mean, come on. Um a lot of it's hype, which is why, once again, I like comedy. I like fighting. I like fucking. You can't fake any of them. You can't. No hype helps you. You gotta just. You gotta have the goods, or you don't. Man, I'm deep <laughs> and repetitive and very, <laughs> very repetitive. <laughs> very repetitive. I feel like ending this podcast on that. <laughs> The book is The Straight A Conspiracy. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Brian, that, that was one of the worst segues of all time. Hunter Mott's <laughs> yeah. Katie O'Brien. We oh, didn't... and by the way, um, I'm going to be in Boston this weekend, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, January 8th, This 9th, is the 10th. weirdest podcast in history. It's good. It's supposed to be. <laughs> is it? Yeah, I said let's do a podcast and just fucking see what it, where it takes us. Uh, laugh Boston, take Laugh us? Boston. 
Thursday, Friday, Saturday, come see me. What were you going to say? Where did it take us, Brian? Who knows, man? <laughs> we just did our thing. Brian, are you really... Here's the real question. At the end of this, are you going to be able to, with a straight face, say that this is the podcast where you learn everything after this episode? Listen, you guys taught some lessons about learning. Sure. Sure. And cat poof coffee and Finn... Yeah got to air for the world his desire to have his bow and arrow back <laughs> all right here's how to here's how to end it okay give me give me your most recent experience where you didn't want to be anywhere else you just wanted to be there experiencing this because it was so incredible or just so unique or so wild oh i will that's an easy answer really yeah it's an easy answer no yeah matter. well i i yeah i mean i was uh at the i had an, a layover in taiwan so i spent the day in taipei and I got to go to the National Palace Museum. And uh, I hadn't realized this, but when uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang, um, they stole everything. Explain or, to the... Yeah, the, so... Chiang so, Kai-shek was the guy who... Yeah, ran. so in the, in the, there was a civil war in China after the collapse of the empire between the communists led by Mao Zedong and the nationalists, the Kuomintang, led by Chiang Kai-shek. So they're fighting over the country. And so, you know, the, the, the nationalists... They take a par- They take all of the stuff out of the Forbidden City. Five thousand years of China's greatest treasures. Really? And as they flee around the country, they bring all of this stuff. So essentially, the contents of China's collected history. And finally, when they realize they can't hold the mainland, they retreat to Taiwan. And so they take everything from the Forbidden City with them to Taiwan. I didn't know that. Yeah, nor did I. So when you go to Taiwan, all of the treasures of 5,000 years of China, its greatest treasures, the ones that the emperors acquired over time, is located in Taiwan. And it's all in this one museum called the National Palace Museum. That is such a fuck you to China. Yeah. No wonder China's like, ah! Yeah. Well, the great thing is, is that the deal that, that what they've, what the China has said, you have to give this shit back. And, and Taiwan is like, yeah, you can have it back when you recognize us as a country. <laughs> Which is Holy so great. Shit. And what is the what did you see in that museum? Well, the collection is so vast and so large that only a fraction of it is ever on display. Jesus. Um, but you know, it's it's the most Chinese museum on the planet. It's lacquerware, it's Ming vases, it's you know, bronze, yeah. it's stone, and a lot of jade. So much jade. And yeah. the, the big star attraction, the Mona Lisa of that museum, the object that you only get to see for two seconds because there's a huge line of people and you are being like pushed past it, the like, I guess the greatest treasure in China's history is the jade cabbage. The jade cabbage. <laughs> and I saw the jade cabbage. So that was the thing. And let me tell you, the jade cabbage is amazing because it's the same thing as Michelangelo's David because it was a bad piece of jade with cracks and fissures and just a really like not great piece of stone. And I know jade. Keep going. Well, Brian, I mean, you have one of the... I mean, I have one of the largest collections, collections in Calabasas. In, that's right. <laughs> of jade. <laughs> um, Fucking jade. But... but uh, so it was a bad piece of jade, and rather than making it into a crap vase, the sculptor used what was there and made an amazing jade cabbage. And the jade cabbage, like he used the fissures to create the ruffles of Whoa. the leaves. There's like crickets w- worked into it that are on the leaves. It's all white and at the bottom, and then the leaves are all green. It's really, really well wow. done. It's a really impressive jade cabbage. And there's all sorts of symbolism. <laughs> Out of yeah, all the jade, jade cabbages, cabbages I've seen, it's a really impressive it's, it's jade the best. cabbage. Yeah. But so they, they did it, and they do, I mean, you know, they, are, they also do a pretty, it's, you know, with museums, I'm always cognizant of, like, did they do a good job of the teaching? Like, do you just, like, look at this thing and be like, what is this random thing? Or do they go to, do a good job of making sure that you're looking at it and getting why it's important? And they did a really good job because apparently white-green, which are the two colors, or green-white is a homophone for the word for purity in Chinese. And so, and it was a gift to one of the emperor's concubines, they think, and the crickets represent fertility. So it's not just that the sculpture is impressive, but there's all this symbolism woven and into the jade cabbage in terms of who it was a gift to. All I all I all I heard was concubines. <laughs> um, Katie, what was your moment? Probably the flow I felt when I was sculpting the jade cabbage. <laughs> I think that's Holy shit. the most Katie O'Brien. Time. 
And not a very Chinese name, but she's a master <laughs> jade sculptress. You also should not joke about this because the communists might kidnap you and say, make another one. <laughs> oh, yeah. kidnap, the, kidnap the hot blonde. Yeah. But make one twice as big. Twice as big. <laughs> yeah, make one twice as big. Uh, what What is your... Uh... Uh, I don't know. Um, Besides when you look into my eyes. Probably, probably right now. There you go. Um, she forgot she was married, so did I. <laughs> I, I think I think the the I want to say like that's the feeling I always get when yeah it's about the work like if you know if I'm yeah. on set and we're filming something that I wrote and we're you know that kind of just totally being aware of every piece of what's happening and being engaged totally being so engaged like that i mean even just whatever we were like sitting around writing and coming up with jokes and and whatever today and we're even that up is with just the tv so, show yeah i mean that's we were coming up with the jade cabbage of we television. were coming up with the, we were coming up with the jade cabbage of television shows. it is it is ladies and gentlemen this has been the brian callen hunter motts no brian don't do that own it. It's yours. I don't know, dude. I, you I, can have one hundred percent. No, one hundred percent ownership. This, this has been the Katie O'Brien show. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Damn. There it is. Well, All Katie, right. if come you really want Boston. this to be an episode of your podcast, yeah. you're welcome to. <laughs> exactly. Come see me in Boston, mofos. See you can come touch me. I'll take pictures with you. We can have. See him in Boston. Fucking go out there and see Brian Callen, all right? You're going to love it. Are you from Boston? Yeah, well, I grew up in southern New Hampshire, like oh, 30 minutes north of Boston. Where in southern New Hampshire? A tiny town called Hampstead. You know where Keene is? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I lost, my first, I lost my first wrestling match in Keene. All right. Did you lose your first virginity there? That's why I thought you were No, right. no. That was in Saudi Arabia. By the way, if you... Oh, I was 14. Really? Yeah, my 14th birthday. But when, who did you lose your virginity to? I, she's married now, so I won't say. But, but is her she... Her first name was Karen. Oh, so you did not lose it to a burqa? No, woman. no, no, no. She was, a, she was a girl from Alabama. Oh, okay. Well, and there you beautiful go. beautiful one at that. But now you've given enough details that I'm sure that... <laughs> yeah, she's a exactly. great girl. Great girl. Um, she's married to a great guy, though. Um, by the way, if you ever want a real experience... I suggest going to Katie's high school because, it, you know, I've seen... Well, that, the, that, that, no. make, that would make me a real creep. <laughs> no, no, Is no, Chris no. Hansen No, on? no, you really... Because we went and spoke at Katie's high school, and let me tell you that I thought Stalin had a cult of personality, and it is nothing compared to the Katie O'Brien cult of personality really? that exists at Pinkerton High. No shit. Oh, Pinkerton oh, Academy. Oh, sorry, Pinkerton Academy. Oh. Of course you went to an academy, a little... It's oh, a public, it a public high, school, high school, but it's in New England, so it's a former private school, it. and you know, looks like Hogwarts. I mean, you know, it so looks like Hogwarts, and you know, everybody like still talks about her, and won't say how many years later, but the but you know, there it really is like cult of personality. Well, all I gotta say, she still looks like she's in high school. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you later. Peace. You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show with Brian Callen. Be sure to like him on Facebook. Just search for Brian Callen Comedy. And follow him on Twitter. Just search for at Brian Callen. You can also find him online by visiting his website. Just go to briancallen.com. Until next time, bye-bye. Bye.